Hey, what's going on? It's Daniel Gillespie here with ThePondArriving.com, and in this video, I'm going to talk to you about how you can legally and ethically boost your income on credit card applications so that you can get approved for better cards and get higher credit limits. But before I jump in, if you're new to this channel, I cover things like credit card rewards, hotels, airfare, and a lot of other interesting travel topics. So if you like that type of stuff, be sure to subscribe and hit that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on anything. So this video is really all about what's known as accessible income, which is basically income that you are allowed to claim on your credit card application, but don't get this confused with accessible income, which is a very different concept that relates to income tax and tax purposes. So just know that this video is only about accessible income with a C and not with an S. So the idea of accessible income comes from the Card Act of 2009, and that act was put into place to just stop the banks from doing a lot of shady stuff. Like they had a lot of hidden fees and credit cards and they were placing due dates for bills at random times like 4 p.m. on a Tuesday or something like that just to catch people and force them to pay extra fees. But it wasn't actually until this act was amended in 2013 that it changed the game for claiming your income on credit card applications. And what this amendment did is it allowed people ages 21 years or older to claim income that they have a reasonable expectation of access to. So the key with this act is what exactly constitutes reasonable expectation of access. Now, I am a former attorney, but this is not in any way meant to be legal advice or a legal opinion. This is just kind of giving you some insight into what could constitute reasonable expectation of access. But if you know anything about the law, you know that whenever the term reasonable is used, it's open to interpretation. It can be very subjective. So just keep that in mind whenever you're trying to figure out in your own situation what might, consider, what might be considered reasonable expectation of access. But to make things a little bit simple, I'm gonna cover three main scenarios that will probably apply to a lot of people and help clear things up for you. So I'm gonna choose three different scenarios that are from the proposed comments for this rule. And these proposed comments, I'm pretty sure were adopted. So these kind of just give you some insight into what that reasonable expectation can mean. And it'll also give you kind of a practical idea of how this could apply in your own life. So the first situation where you might have a reasonable expectation of access is whenever you have a joint account with somebody else. So if you don't know, a joint account is whenever both your name and their name are both on the account. And essentially you both have some ownership that you can claim on that account. Now this is what the proposed comments noted. If a household member's salary is deposited into a joint account shared with the applicant, an issuer is permitted to consider that salary as the applicant's income for purposes of this section. So what this means is that if you and your partner have a joint checking account, let's say, and both of your salaries are deposited into the same account, and let's say you both make $50,000 a year, well, in that case, I take it to mean that you could actually claim $100,000 as your income because the income is going into a joint account that you have direct access to. But what about if the salary is not deposited directly into account that you share with someone else? What if instead they simply transfer a portion of their salary into an account that is only in your name? If that's the case, then things are gonna be a little bit different and you can turn to the proposed comments to see how this situation plays out. So what this proposed comment says is that it assumed that the household member regularly transfers a portion of his or her salary, which in the first instance is directly deposited into an account to which the applicant does not have access from that account into a second account to which the applicant does have access. Okay, so in this case, it's like your partner getting paid in their own personal checking account and then they simply transfer funds over from that checking account into your checking account. It says then that the applicant then uses the amount to which he or she has access for the payment of household or other expenses. An issuer is permitted to consider the portion of the salary deposited into the account to which the applicant has access as the applicant's income for purposes of the section. So this is a big difference because it means if your partner got their salary deposited into their account and then moved it over to your account, you only can actually consider the portion that is transferred into your account as part of your income. So let's say that your partner was making 100,000, you were making 50,000, if they transferred over say $25,000 per year into your account, well now your total income could be 75,000. So now there's a third scenario, and in this scenario, you actually don't get any access to their account, but instead the partner or spouse or whoever it is simply pays for your expenses on a regular basis. So the comments state that this, um, this proposed comment assumed that no portion of the household member's salary is deposited into an account to which the applicant has access. 
However, the household member regularly uses that salary to pay for the applicant's expenses. The example clarified that an issuer is permitted to consider the household member's salary as the applicant's income for purposes of this section because the applicant has a reasonable expectation of access to that salary. So in this case, all of a sudden, there's no mention of just using a portion of the salary. They just mentioned the basically the total salary. So it sounds like the key here is if that person regularly uses their salary to cover your expenses, then you can use that salary on your credit card application. So this to me is gonna be one of the more subjective categories of accessible income. But what it could look like is if you had uh, a spouse or maybe even like a parent who covered your ordinary bills, maybe covered your food, your rent, or other bills like utilities, things like that, then you could possibly use their income in full on your credit card application. Now you're gonna to wanna to use your best judgment here because all it says is to cover your expenses. So in some cases, I mean, if they're just paying for your Netflix every month or something like that, I mean, that's not really in the spirit of this rule, I don't think. I think it's gonna to need to be more meaningful expenses and it's just gonna be a good idea for you to use your best judgment on what might actually fit this rule in your own personal situation. So those are three different situations where you can use accessible income to your advantage to boost your income on your credit card application, and at least you can have some basis for doing so. And you can find these comments and the rule in the article below, so if you ever have any questions or if you end up doing this and you wanna have some kind of support on your side, you can find those links below and always have something to at least refer to. Now in the end, most banks actually don't verify your income. There are some situations where some banks do on a credit card application ask you to submit something like tax forms, but for the most part, they don't like to verify your income and it really only comes into play if for some reason your account was flagged or under review. In that case, they oftentimes will ask you to provide tax forms. So in any case, you don't want to lie or inflate your income without a real basis which is why this accessible income concept is so great because you can boost your income on the application and then have a legitimate basis for why you did so in the event that you were ever reviewed for something. And by the way, you can also use accessible income when applying for credit limit increases. So if you wanna get your credit card increased from say 5,000 to $10,000, you can actually use that accessible income whenever you apply for those credit limit increases. And by the way, I have articles for credit limit increases, how to get those done on major banks like Chase, City, and Amex. And if you wanna find those links, you can find them in the article below. So that's all for this video. I hope that it was helpful. And if you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, be sure to subscribe and like this video. Thanks a lot.